Hi, and welcome to another edition of Your Health with Dr. Christy. My name is Dr. Christy Reisinger, and today we're going to talk about what I think may be the most important vitamin that we all should be taking, and that's vitamin D. I'll share data with you on why vitamin D is such an important vitamin to take and give some guidance on how to get it naturally and through supplementation. But at the end of the day, it's so important that you speak with your own doctor about a recommendation that's personalized for you. If you were my patient, I would always start by checking a blood test called a 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It's a simple blood test that does not need to be done while you're fasting. This would allow me to see what your vitamin D level is, and based on this result, we would come up with a plan to get your vitamin D back up to sufficient levels. So why is a sufficient level of vitamin D so important? Did you know that taking a vitamin D supplement has been shown to reduce the risk of getting a respiratory tract infection by almost 50%? Did you know that a low vitamin D level can increase your risk of community-acquired pneumonia by 64%? Did you know that patients with a low vitamin D level have a greater risk of getting COVID-19, being hospitalized for COVID-19, being ventilated for COVID-19, and dying from COVID-19? Did you know that vitamin D supplementation may potentially reduce deaths from cancer by 13%? Well, let's go through some of the data that backs up the above claims. But first, let me define how I will be using the terms sufficiency, insufficiency and deficiency of vitamin D. In my practice, we usually measure 25-hydroxy vitamin D or the circulating form of vitamin D in nanograms per milliliter, but other countries and labs may use nanomoles per liter. As you can see in this chart, to convert from nanogram per milliliter to nanomoles per liter, you simply multiply by 2.5. I will be using nanogram per milliliter in the rest of my presentation. So deficiency is defined as less than 20. Insufficiency is 20 to 30. Insufficiency or a normal level is greater than 30. Circulating levels of greater than 100 are considered toxic and can have side effects. Okay, now on to the data. A large meta-analysis published in the British Medical Journal in 2017 with over 10,000 people from 25 trials in 15 countries investigated whether taking a vitamin D supplement helped to prevent colds, flu, and chest infections. Vitamin D had a significant protective effect overall in reducing the numbers of respiratory tract infections, but this effect was especially seen in patients that started off with a very low level of vitamin D. In those patients, the risk of having at least one respiratory infection was reduced from 60% to 32%. Furthermore, a newer analysis from 2019 published in the journal Medicine had 21,000 participants from across eight studies. This meta-analysis showed that participants with a deficient level of vitamin D had a 64% increase in the risk of getting community-acquired pneumonia. Another longitudinal study from Germany followed over 9,500 adults aged 50 to 75 over 15 years. Wow, that's such a long time and they looked at their levels of vitamin D and its association with death from a respiratory illness, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. They first saw that vitamin D insufficiency and deficiency were very common and affected about 59% of the participants. A very severe vitamin D deficiency of less than 12 was associated with an increased risk of death from cardiovascular disease and cancer but the effect of low vitamin D was especially seen in death from respiratory illnesses. And after they removed other variables that may have had a confounding effect, a person's risk is increased two to three times when their vitamin D level is less than 20. The authors state, quote, overall 41% of deaths from respiratory diseases were statistically attributable to vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency and could possibly be avoided by overcoming these conditions, assuming causality of the association. This is a stunning statement. Knowing these things about vitamin D and respiratory infections and pneumonia, could vitamin D possibly be helpful in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19? Well, yes, the data is starting to appear that it can. 
Vitamin D data was available for 499 COVID-19 patients from Chicago for the year prior to COVID-19 testing. Being likely vitamin D deficient, which was defined as being vitamin D deficient at the last available time point without an increase of vitamin D treatment at the time of COVID-19 testing was associated with a 1.8 fold increased risk of being tested positive for COVID-19 as compared to those who had vitamin D sufficiency. Another interesting study showing a possible connection between vitamin D levels and COVID-19 severity was published in the journal Nature in November 2020. This study had two different groups, group A with asymptomatic COVID-19 infections, and there were 91 patients in this group, and group B who were severely ill patients with COVID-19 that required ICU admission. There were 63 people in this group. The prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was 33% in group A and 97% in group B. The fatality rate was high in the vitamin D deficient patients and it was 21% versus 3% in patients with a sufficient level of vitamin D. The authors concluded that vitamin D deficiency markedly increases the risk of having severe disease with a COVID-19 infection. And finally, if you haven't been convinced yet of the benefits of a vitamin D supplement, a meta-analysis published in the Annals of Oncology in February 2019 may change your mind. In this study, they looked at 10 trials with over 6,400 patients. These trials followed patients for three to 10 years. And the question they had was whether vitamin D supplementation could prevent cancer from occurring or also prevent death from cancer. They found that cancer deaths were reduced by 13% with vitamin D supplementation, and the greatest benefit occurred when the supplement was taken daily rather than a very high dose infrequently. Furthermore, although they did not see a benefit with prevention of cancer, I do agree with the researchers that because many cancers take so long to develop, having a three to 10 year follow-up may simply not be long enough. I like the way the researchers stated it in their article, quote, adult cancers typically develop over several decades and vitamin D could act on early stages of carcinogenesis. In this case, three to 10 years of follow-up periods of randomized control trials in this meta-analysis may have been insufficient to observe an effect, end quote. And there has been a benefit seen with vitamin D supplementation and the prevention of precancerous colon polyps as well as a possible benefit to reducing the risk of ovarian cancer. So if you are convinced that it's time to increase your vitamin D levels, what's the best way to do this? Well, unfortunately, this is a really complicated question, which is why I really recommend that you first start with a 25-hydroxy vitamin D blood test. This will at least let you and your doctor know where you're starting. But we know that vitamin D deficiency of a level less than 20 is common. Data from 2011 indicates that the overall prevalence rate of vitamin D deficiency was about 42% in the United States, with the highest rate seen in blacks of 82%, followed by Hispanics with 69%. And one of the safest ways to get an adequate amount of vitamin D is through the sun's rays hitting your skin. Your body will never have too much vitamin D if you're getting it this way. The body knows intuitively how to regulate it. The recommendation is about 15 minutes of direct sunlight on your skin, and don't worry about sunscreen's effect on it. Just use your usual sunscreen. But realize if you have darker skin, you may need to be out in the sun for a longer period of time. And the farther you live from the equator, the greater the chance is that you're not getting enough vitamin D through sunlight. People living above the 37th parallel, both on the Northern and Southern hemisphere are at even greater risk. If this is not the route you plan to take, you can always look for natural forms of vitamin D in foods such as fatty fish like tuna, mackerel, and salmon. Cheese and egg yolks are also good sources. Some foods can be fortified with vitamin D like dairy products, orange juice, soy milk, and cereal. If you still think you're not getting enough vitamin D, and to be honest, many of us aren't, especially in the winter months, then you can take a vitamin D3 supplement. 
You can see from this chart that there are three different recommendations from three different organizations about the recommended doses for adults, and they vary widely. So if you're just going to take a supplement without checking your level first, I think a safe place to start would be between 1,500 to 5,000 international units daily. The chances of having a toxic level of vitamin D are very low. I've never seen it occur in any of my patients. So at the end of the day, I want to stress that any supplementation is conversation that needs to be had between you and your doctor. But I do think this is such an important vitamin to take. It has so many benefits. Thanks for joining me.